Good evening. Good evening. I just want to tell you my story. My dad was a pastor. And so about the age of 10, I pretty much knew how churches operated. I used to help lead services and used to play the piano with the Tuesday night prayer meeting. When we went on a holiday as a family in our caravan, if there wasn't a church nearby, we'd hold a little service, just the four of us. My mum would lead the choir, my kid brother would read the notices, and I would preach. I'd preach to my family. And so I guess it was no surprise that at age 18, I was a youth pastor. Age 23, I was an associate minister. And age 29, I was a senior pastor. In fact, when I first preached here in 2015, I was the youngest ever member of the Ministers of Larger Churches Conference. Oh, it just felt so good. <laughs> they say that every church wants a pastor who's 35 with 25 years experience. Well, that was me. I was young and enthusiastic and energetic. But I was only tending to the externals of life. And if you could have seen on the inside, it would have told a different story. The truth was I was still trying to prove myself worthy. And so I set about being all things to all men because I was just desperately trying to get everyone to like me. Almost as if I was wearing an invisible sign above my head which read, if I preach well, if I solve your problem, if I visit you on your sickbed, will you love me? Will you accept me? And underneath my insecurity and affirmation addiction, my lack of a prayer life and my feeling of a failure as a husband because we just couldn't seem to get pregnant, were slowly eating me away on the inside and so in 2016 I went along to a Christian conference yes it was the larger churches conference I'd never wanted to miss that one and I was sat there like you are now and I the speaker began a, a, and it I realized something was going wrong inside me it was like a distorted radio was going off in the back of my head I thought well maybe I'm tired I'll sleep it off went up to my room next morning came down it was the same again this time it was like I was underwater I just couldn't quite hear what was being said. I thought something seriously is going wrong here. I took myself home, drove home, got into bed, and it was like a switch went off in the back of my head. I just shut down. I went from being pretty high functioning overnight to not being able to do anything. It wasn't as if when the phone rang, I didn't want to answer it. Just the thought of even looking to see who it was filled me with dread and fear. Went to the doctor and he said, Jim, you need to stop completely today. Well, this was about December the 10th. <laughs> I said, I couldn't possibly. It's Christmas coming up. I'm looking at my diary. He said, Jim, you need to stop completely today. So he signed me off work for a month and another month and another month. After six months, I resigned my position in the church. And that happened at 37. And the doctor said, if you had carried on, I dread to think what would have happened at 57. How would it got so bad? Well, we all know that God speaks to us through the Bible and through prayer and through sermons. But God also speaks to us through our bodies and our mind and our heart. But I was ignoring the signs. I wonder if any of these you can identify with. I found that I was becoming easily irritated. Just had a, a short fuse getting grumpy I, I kind of lost my joy and, and my creativity I was just doing the bare minimum to get by and, and my emotions were, were just flat you know I never felt excitement I never felt crushed everything was just flat I just lost my passion physical symptoms headaches and stomach cramps I was gradually increasing my intake of coffee in the day and wine in the evening now, for some of you, these things are absolutely alien. But for others of you, this is a little too close for comfort. And the clincher was this. In my decision to step back in that time from <coughs> senior church leadership, it was over a pint with a, a wise mentor. And we sat there. And I'd been given so much super spiritual advice, you know, the sort of thing people put on cars, you know, uh, seek the Lord and he'll show you the way, you know. My friend sat opposite me and he said, Jim, he said, let me ask you this. He said, let me put it simply. What are the most important things in your life at the moment? Without skipping a beat, I, I said, my health, 
having a sustainable marriage and starting a family. One, two, three. And my friend Ken said to me, well, Jim, he said, why don't you do what's going to give those things the best shot of success? We're going back to church, give them, I said, no. Going back to the church, sorry. Going back to the church will give those things the worst shot of success. He said, well, maybe there's your answer. And so while undoubtedly it was one of the worst times of my life, everything that I was proud of about myself was suddenly taken away. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to stop and reassess where my life was heading, to do some soul searching and reevaluate the value I was placing on some things and not on others. It involved medication, which I thank God for. Of course, everything can be overdone, but I don't know why Christians have got such a hang up of antidepressants. Thank God for the man who invented that drug. It involved counseling, which I thank God for. It involved a lifestyle change. After the six months, the GP said, well, you've got a choice. You can keep taking the tablets or you can change your diet and do some strenuous exercise three times a week and it'll probably have the same effect. It worked, it was true. But most of all, I had to face up to myself in the mirror. Most of all, I had to face God. And that's the hardest work any of us will ever have to do. And in those early weeks when I was completely undone, couldn't contribute anything, could hardly fill the dishwasher for goodness sake. One verse just kept coming uncanny eventually i started going to a local church just sat on the back row the guy preached on it someone sent me a card it was in the card this little verse we just had it read you are worth more than many sparrows i couldn't contribute anything and god <laughs> valued me just for who i am Amen. not for what i could do I've preached on this stuff for years, but it was a, a revelation. I'd never been in a situation where I couldn't contribute anything. You're worth more than many sparrows. So in the remaining time that we've got, I want to talk to you just about one of the lessons that I've been learning. And the lesson is all about contentment. Paul picks up the theme, doesn't he, in 1 Timothy 6, 6, for godliness with contentment is of great gain. For we brought nothing into this world and we can take nothing out of this world. But if we have food and clothes, we should be content with that. And then he gives his own testimony in Philippians 4.12 where he says, I know what it is to have plenty and I know what it is to be in need. And I have learned the secret of contentment. What a thing. He was writing this from prison. But he said, I've learned to be content. And is it reassuring that even St. Paul said it was something he had to learn? It's not one of those things that is just given to us the day we become a Christian. And yet, especially in this day and age, contentment, true contentment, is one of life's rarest virtues. To be able to go home after church and sit in your chair and want for nothing. But just like Paul found, contentment is possible. And I've discovered two pathways in particular to contentment that God lays out in his word. I just want to share those with you. The first one is this, by discovering the power of thankfulness. Paul tells the Colossians in chapter 2, verse 7, be overflowing with thankfulness. And the secret of having a thankfulness attitude is to stop always wanting what you have. have stop always, what, what is it? <laughs> Look at my notes. I've learned this secret so well. Stop always having what you want, got there, and start wanting what you have. Having what you want is the message all around. In fact, there's a multi-billion pound industry about it. It's called advertising. Getting you to want something you don't have. Secret of contentment is not having what you want, but wanting what you already have. This completely transformed my mindset. Instead, you start looking for things to be thankful for rather than focusing what you don't have all the time. Absolutely revolutionary. 
I read this lovely quote from the 19th century philosopher R.W. Emerson, and he said this. If the stars only came out one night a year, we'd all stay up to watch them. As it is, they come out every night and we never stay up. So this week I challenge you, as I challenge myself most weeks, to find one thing every day to give thanks for. Sounds easy, sounds simple, but just see how it gradually transforms your mindset. So the first pathway to contentment, discover the power of thankfulness. The second one is this, discover the power of rest. Or to use the Bible word, Sabbath. Sabbath keeping is so important that it's included right up there with the Ten Commandments. Ever thought about that? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy? How many Christians, how many pastors flagrantly break the fourth commandment. Well, maybe you're okay with keeping nine out of ten. I don't know. Most days, the average GP will have a patient complain of being T-A-T-T. -T. Anyone know? Tired all the time. One Christian GP wrote, whenever I sign people off work, I'm just giving them their Sabbaths in arrears. And don't get me wrong. Some people are just lazy. Some people need to read the first half of the commandment. Six days, you shall labor. <laughs> but for most of us, okay, we have different metabolism and capacity, I get that. But we all are designed that our body, mind and soul need rest. But the thing I learned during that time is that slouching in front of the TV hour after hour doesn't actually give you rest. Annoyingly, you can get through all the box sets and be no more rested at the end of it. And that wise mentor that asked me what's the most important thing in your life, he said this, he said, Jim, when was the last time you just walked in the park and just kicked the leaves? Just kick the leaves. Ever tried it? No phone calls to answer, just kick the leaves. You don't produce anything. Interesting experiment. Then he took out a napkin and he sketched this. We've got it on the screen. He said, imagine this is your emotional tank. And he got me to write down on the left hand side everything that fills my tank. Whenever I do it, I just feel alive and, and enriched and like I've got a purpose. And then he got me to write on the right hand side everything that drains my tank. Things that when I do it, I just feel spent. And then he said, you ought to have as many things coming in as going out. Kind of makes sense, doesn't it, if any of you are into physics. <laughs> but what do we do? We don't do that. What do we do? What we do is we say, oh, well, this month I've got extra things on this side. I've got too many things, so I haven't got time to do any of this stuff. So there's an extra, this tap's being turned on even more. We turn off this tap. What's going to happen? It's going to go to the bottom even faster, twice as quick. Here's a very practical suggestion. I wonder if any of you are, are up for this. Have a screen-free Sabbath. <laughs> so your phone's off. How's the world going to spin on its axis if you can't be got hold of? TV off? It's a bit difficult with the Six Nations, I'll give you that. But invest in recreation. You know where you are recreated. So if you're someone who normally rushes around, here's the, here's the challenge. On Sundays, slow down. <laughs> Sorry, you're expecting something a bit more profound. <laughs> slow down. Walk to church, if you possibly can. Take time to... Take time to listen, really listen to your spouse. If I interviewed your spouse or your partner uh, or your best friend today, and I think, goodness, Sarah's not here. Where is she? I, I, I'm going you know, to stop saying this stuff when she arrives because you might ask her. <laughs> and I said, give me an honest answer. Does your partner really listen to you? Play with your children. Or have you forgotten how to play? By the way, if you do have children, and if you don't, if you're single, 
I don't want you to feel excluded. Invest in quality friendships. Invest in those intimate friendships. But if you do have children, you're responsible for their Sabbath. When they're an adult, they can do as they please. You're responsible for their Sabbath. If your children do homework every Sunday, now I'm not saying be legalistic if they've got a deadline on a Monday, but if your children are working seven days a week, you are depriving them of one of God's greatest gifts to his people. Okay, that of course is just half the story on Sabbath, isn't it? Because Sabbath is not just about physical rest. Jesus says, Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come to me if you're weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And you will find rest for what? For your soul. For your soul. The problem, of course, is that so often we're so insecure that we're just desperate to please and need to be needed. You may even feel guilty for taking rest or, or recreation. This is something pastors really struggle with. I couldn't possibly go to the park and kick the leaves. What if someone in my congregation sees me and wonders why I'm not in a meeting? Because often if we're honest, and you may be far more saintly than I am, just being honest, what others think about us is more important than what God thinks about us. Can we be honest and own up to that sometimes? Taking a true Sabbath proves that we're getting our self-worth and value from God, not from what we do, even what we do for him. Do you know, sometimes I think what's going on is that we're afraid to slow down because it means we've got to look at ourselves in the mirror. It means we've got to face those demons which busyness keep at bay our loneliness and our regrets and our fears. And so Sabbath is really all about trust. God's people had to trust that he would provide. Remember blind Bartimaeus in Mark 10? It says this little phrase, throwing his cloak aside, he ran to Jesus to be healed. That cloak was probably his only possession. It's like a little tent, protecting from the sun in the summer and the, the wind in the winter. But Giving his life to Jesus meant casting aside his own security and running to Jesus to be healed. The American pastor Gordon MacDonald, after 60 years of ministry, written numerous books, he'd been an advisor to presidents. This is what he said. He said, these days I find that I am content to be a child of God, a husband to my wife, a father to my children and grandchildren, a friend to all who would share their life with me and a servant to my community. I'm going to start coming into land. If anything I've said have been ringing alarm bells, then don't wait till it's too late. Get some help. Come forward for prayer. Go and see your doctor. Get some counselling. But don't wait until you're having to claw your way back. These days, I do 100 funerals a year. And as people get up and talk about their loved one's life. I sometimes think I wish the person could be here to hear all the lovely things being said about them. I know. It's the great irony of funerals. The one person it's all about is the one person who can't be there and they always miss it by just a couple of days. <laughs> so as I close, I want to read to you a poem that I often like to read at funerals that I sometimes wish I could have read to the person before they died. It's not written by a Christian, so it hasn't got a, a sense of the afterlife. I always bring that in afterwards, but it's worth repeating and perhaps a little wake up call. It's called The Dash by Linda Ellis. And she writes this. I read of a man who stood to speak at the funeral of a friend and he referred to the dates on his coffin from the beginning to the end. He noted that first came the date of his birth he spoke of the second date with tears. But he said what mattered most of all was the little dash between those years. For that dash represents all the time he spent alive on earth. And now only those who love him know what that little line is worth. For it matters not how much we own, the cars, the house, the cash. What matters is how we live and love 
and how we spend our dash. So think about this long and hard. Are there things you'd like to change? For you never know how much time is left that can still be rearranged. If we could slow down enough to consider what's true and real, and always try to understand the way other people feel, and be less quick to anger, and show appreciation more, and love the people in our lives like we've never loved before. If we treat each other with respect and more often wear a smile, remembering that this special dash might only last a little while. So when your eulogy is being read, with your life's actions to rehash, would you be proud of what they'd say about how you spent your dash? Guys, I hardly know any of you, much less the situations you're facing. I get how hard it is just to stay afloat sometimes without some preacher coming along and telling you not to use your mobile on a Sunday. <laughs> Please don't get the impression that I'm an expert. I'm very much still learning. In fact, tonight's the first time I've spoken about this stuff. But I'm here to testify to a God of grace, a God who's so kind and loving and promises, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I wonder if there's one person who needs to go away and remember you are not alone and you are not forsaken. And for us, the ultimate blessing on this new style of life is that after 12 years of marriage, having turned 40 and almost given up hope three months ago, Sarah gave birth to Molly. <laughs> Molly means longed for child. And her middle name is Hope. God has a wonderful plan for your life. He's not given up on you. He's not forgotten you. He's heard your prayers. And as you learn to be content in him, I pray that you will discover the power of rest and the power of thankfulness. But let, let me pray. Father God, I want to give thanks for who you are. Some of us, that word father is a little bit loaded. But thank you that you're the best possible father we could have ever imagined. So kind and gracious, but so committed to us that you don't leave us where we are. And so we invite you, because we trust you, we invite you to take us by the hand and lead us into your ways. Like Moses prayed, show me your ways. And Lord, if there's a bit of grief, in letting go of some of my ways. Some of us have been nursing those wounds for far too long. Grudge against others. A bit of disappointment at the way things have turned out. A bit of fear. Lord, because we trust you, we allow you to lead us into your ways, turning our back on those things. So again, I pray, come Holy Spirit, and just sense God's grace over your life. Just sense him calling you by name, and just surrender your life afresh to him. Thank you, Lord. Amen.